Welcome to the waves and sound lesson on the two-point interference pattern. You're going to need this diagram that was handed out in class today. And on this diagram, what's important to note is that S1 is the first source of waves, and S2 is a second point source of waves. And in this diagram, the two sources are in phase with each other. S1 Source 1 and Source 2 are in phase. What that means is that when one is producing a crest, the other is producing a crest at the identical moment. And when the other is producing a trough, the other is uh, also producing a trough at that same identical moment. At this time, we're going to switch over to a really neat simulation to show you so that you understand exactly what it is we're talking about with this two-point interference pattern of waves. All right, here we are at the simulation. Uh, this is a ripple tank applet. And what I've done is I've set this up ahead of time to be two point sources. You can see source one here on the, or we'll do it identical to the handout. So source one will be here on the left and source two will be here on the right. And when I start this simulation moving, what you can see is that these two sources have an identical frequency as indicated by when this produces a crest in the water this one is also producing a crest and when the one on the left is producing a trough indicated by the dark line the other one's also producing a trough at the exact same time obviously it's what's happening here is that as these waves spread out they're going to overlap each other and they're going to produce the really interesting two-point interference pattern that you're going to see here in a moment as I continue to let this run. So as we continue to let it run, you can see a really neat pattern developing. And if you follow my cursor here, right up the center, you can see alternating little waves, bright and dark. But then there's this distinct line I'm now showing with my cursor, showing no movement of the medium at all. And we have a bunch of these through here. Okay. What obviously must be happening is that as these waves cross over each other, they're going to interfere constructively and destructively. This line right up the middle is a line of constructive interference. More on that to come. And it's indicated because we actually see the waves moving. In fact, it's double the amplitude of the original waves being produced. Just here to the right of that and to the left of that, we see no movement at all in the medium. In fact, if this were actual water, the water would be still. That could only be happening if there was destructive interference going on where the crests and troughs cancel each other out. Okay, so let's head back to our diagram and figure out um, this is a really cool pattern, but guess what? In physics, it also has usefulness, and let's head back to the diagram to discuss that. Okay, we're back at the diagram, and you're going to want to come up with a way on this diagram to have a key that distinguishes between lines of constructive interference and lines of destructive interference. You can do this by color coding like I'm going to do where you could simply use a solid line for the constructive and a dashed line for the destructive, however you want to set it up. I'm going to use red to indicate lines of reinforcement which will be formed by constructive interference. Alright, let's start to draw some of these on this diagram. Where would they be? Well, we already saw from the simulation that one is right down the middle. So we're looking for places where the crests from source one and the crests from source two line up. There would be one right here, another one here, and I'm marking them with X's all the way up through. We can also see, if I was to mark 
uh, the middle of a white region and the middle of another white region. And these would be troughs on this diagram. And we would mark those all the way down through here. I'm not going to do that because it's more accurate to use the solid lines since they are narrower than the white bands. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to connect um, our spots of constructive interference with a smooth line. And obviously, um, for the center, um, that smooth line is going to be um, a straight line. So we want to draw that right up through the middle as best we can. Okay. I'm going to try to straighten mine out a little bit here. Kind of struggling with uh, getting it to stay on there. And I think you get the point. Now to the right of this, let's find another region of constructive interference. We're putting X's all the way up where these crests are meeting crests. And what you note is now that we're away from the center straight line of reinforcement, the lines of reinforcement start to bend a little. So you're going to have to freehand the best you can, a nice smooth uh, curve through those, through those points that looks something like that. To the right of that, we see another region where crests and troughs are lining up. That would be through there. Let's draw one more. To the right of that. Okay. Now we could do the same thing on the left side of the diagram. We're not going to do that because it gets to be too many lines to understand after a while. Um, but we could do that if we wanted to. I'm now going to use green to indicate lines of destructive interference, which are called nodal lines. Again, this is where destructive interference is taking place. Where would that be? On our diagram, that's where a crest from one source is going to line up with a trough of the other source. If we look just to the right of the center line of reinforcement, I'm going to mark with my green where this crest is meeting the center of that trough all the way up through in between these pair of lines of reinforcement. We see this area where crests and troughs are lining up. Connect those with a smooth curve. Now in between our first line of reinforcement from the center and our second one, we see another region, which if we draw carefully right in the middle, all the way up through, connect that with a smooth curve. And let's do one more in between the next pair of lines of reinforcement and connect those spots with a smooth curve. This explains how the pattern is formed, but really does not explain its usefulness. We're going to step into that next. And what we're going to do, I'm going to switch over to blue. We're going to select a point on the pattern that lies on the center line of reinforcement. And I'm just going to pick this spot right here. I know it's not exactly on my line. I'm sure yours is drawn better. 
straight up the middle. And I'm going to call that point, that blue point I just labeled, I'm going to call it P1. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to draw a line segment from source 1 to P1 and from source 2 to P1. Let's see if I can pull that off a little bit better than my other line. So from P1 to S1 and from S2 to P1. And I'm going to call and what we want to do is make a comparison of line segment S1 and line uh, S1 P1 and line segment S2 P2. So you guys know this that if I took S1 P1, the length of S1 P1, and I subtracted the length of S2 P2, I'm sorry, S2 P1. That the length, because it's right down the middle of the pattern, that the length of S1 P1 and the length of S2 P1 are identical, so their difference would be zero. I think we get that. Now I'm going to select another point, and I'm going to select this point right here that lies on the first nodal line to the right of the center line of reinforcement, and I'm going to call that P2. I'm now going to draw, again, two line segments that go from S1 to P2 and S2 to P2. And here's where this really gets neat. Which line segment is longer? Well, because P2 is to the right of the center, S1 P2 would be longer than S2 P2. And if I take the length of line segment S2, P2, sorry, I apologize, S1, P2. And I subtract the length of line segment S2, P2. It turns out that that difference is equal to one half the wavelength of the waves producing the source. So if we consider the distance between this line right here and this line right here to be a wavelength, which it would be, if we were to measure the difference between those two line segments, that means the value of that difference turns out to be, if that's lambda, in between these two, half a wavelength. That's pretty cool. Now, let's continue to... Uh, look at some other points along the way. Here's point P3. And if I take line segment S1 P3, and I'm not going to draw it on here because it gets to be too many lines and muddies up the diagram, and subtract the line segment S2 P3, we get a whole wavelength for the path difference between those two. For P4, line segment S1, P4, minus line segment S2, P4, turns out to be one and a half, or three halves wavelength. For P5, which lies on the next line of reinforcement, S1, P5, minus S2 P5 turns out to be two whole wavelengths. So you can see, continuing on, if we were to continue on, P6 would have a path difference of five halves or two and a half wavelengths. P7, line segments drawn to it, would have a path difference of three whole wavelengths. So I think you're probably picking up on the pattern. Lines of reinforcement on this pattern show whole number wavelength path differences, while nodal lines on the in-phase pattern show half wavelength multiples for path differences. Asking class to see the simulation, what happens if S1 and S2 are out of phase? And that'll do it for this conversation.